Today we have the pleasure of a visit from Professor Anne Buttimer from Clark University in Massachusetts, who is visiting the Department of Geography in the Faculty of Environmental Studies, where she gave a seminar this morning on some aspects of her, her research in human geography. This afternoon, we are going to have a conversation with Professor Ann Buttimer, and joining us is Professor Leonard Gelke of the Department of Geography. I'm Peter Nash from the same department, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Buttimer, Dr. Gelke. Dr. Buttimer, unfortunately, is with us only for a very short period of time. But I'm delighted to have her visit because she's my, one of my favorite geographers. Uh, because she's very much interested in some of the same areas of research, some of the same problems that I'm interested in. And this morning when I introduced Anne, that I indicated that perhaps she is now, as far as I'm concerned, the, uh, the first lady in geography. Uh, when I was a student at UCLA, my first lady was Ruth Ball, a disciple of Ellen Churchill Semple, who directed my master's thesis, but she passed away almost 20 years ago. And then when I became more active professionally, the first lady to me was Jacqueline Beaujeu Garnier from the University of Paris, the Sorbonne, who is an eminent applied geographer, a lady with much charm and wit. But she will be retiring very shortly Unfortunately, she's not in the best of health, but I'm glad that he, there's somebody to take her place. And um, I, I'm just very happy that you are as interested in some of the problems of applied geography and the history of geographic thought as uh, Jacqueline Bourgeau Garnier is and, and has been. And of course, the two of you have also much in common because you both are interested in the history of geographic thought in, in France and you know each other Thank very you. well. In fact, Dr. Buttimer has written a book on the, the history of the development of geographic thinking in France and it's considered one of the outstanding volumes in geographic literature. Perhaps to, so that the uh, viewers can get to know you a little bit, Anne, would you tell them in a few words how you got interested in the field of geography? Um, how, uh, I know it's, it's a rather intriguing story. I don't want to steal your thunder. And I think it sounds uh, like a, a very special story when it comes from your own lips. <laughs> well, I'm... I'm not sure I can tell it in a few words, but to be truthful, I had uh, very little interest in geography as a student at school, in high school or a grade school. Um, got interested in college, uh, again by accident rather than design. I was majoring in Latin and mathematics and got a little bored with engineers and clerics and saw there was a fun crowd going to the geography class and I went over and took geography courses. And I had a marvelous teacher, I think one of the best I've ever had. And he, incidentally, has not written. He's not represented in the archives, but he was a, he was a wonderful teacher, uh, Professor O'Connell, University College Cork. Uh, I finished a uh, degree subject in geography and uh, then wanted to do an MA in Latin, but couldn't because I didn't have enough Greek. So I was told I could do an MA in geography if I wanted, so I proceeded. 
And so I, I did my MA in geography uh, before coming to this country, before joining the order and so on. Uh, and then the second reason for con picking up geography again was holy obedience rather than choice. <laughs> the order needed somebody to teach geography. I was asked if I'd be willing to give it a try, and I did. Give it a try. <laughs> you were told to teach geography. Yes, I was told to, that's there was what you did. a bard was needed to uh, to teach a course in geography. So you went to the University of Washington. Yes, right. closest department to where. And there you you had some very important mentors. Yes. <laughs> Why don't you mention some of them? I think. I think yes. our viewers probably will have heard of some of them. Well, Professor Morgan Thomas was assigned the responsibility of taking care of me. See, Morgan had done a degree at Belfast, and the Irish connection was enough to suggest to the chairman that an Irishman or somebody with Irish connections ought to take care of this strange oddity that had arrived in his department. So uh, he also knew Professor Eston Evans. He was a student of Eston Evans, and I had Eston Evans as an external examiner for my MA. So he was my advisor, and he was an excellent advisor. Um, he got me oriented toward uh, regional economic theory and that whole uh, regional science approach to industrial location, development theory, and so forth. But I also had other teachers, and among those, I think I remember Professor Ullman best. He was a friend of yours. And I owe a tremendous amount to Professor Ullman. Uh, a lot of what he did not say, okay, but as well as what he did say. Uh, I found him a very inspiring person to know. Yeah, that's an, an important bond between us. Yes. I think this is a very intriguing thing that not only in our field, but in many fields, when two individuals meet and they had a common mentor, yes. I think it immediately it gives, a them a, gives them a bond. Um, not necessarily that they believe that they share the same philosophy, but they know that they went the same type of training yes. uh, and had and shared some of the same experiences yes. and frustrations too. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And I'm sure you weren't shared some of the frustrations. Oh yes, exasperated to death, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm sure that they had made it mutual. But I also had Professor Morrow, for example, who taught quantitative methods, and the visitors were impressive. I mean, we had Darby for a term, and then we had Professor Michael for a summer. And I think Professor Michael's, co Michael's course was, was the most important in getting me to have more self-confidence in some alternative kind of geography to the kind of regional science and economics that I had been treated up to then. So about what Year, were you, what years were you at the University of Washington? 63, 62, 63, that 64, 65. That's really after the height of the quantitative revolution, uh, was it not? Yeah, so I gather. I mean, very. Were very you impacted so by the quantification, quantitative oh, revolution? The spirit of the times. I went <laughs> there. Our textbooks were the papers and proceedings of the Regional Science Association. The Lund volumes were the, the prized uh, things. And uh, yes, everybody, nearly everybody, was talking that kind of language, and I, as a good, dutiful nun, would learn what I was supposed to learn. And, uh, but then at night, I would sneak in these other readings, you know, on the French school, and I loved Marvin's course. I felt guilty about feeling so excited about it <laughs> for a while, but then uh, he encouraged me to, to read into the German literature, Swedish, Dutch, French. With your background in mathematics, you didn't have any problems with the quantitative revolution, but then you had enough inspiration, on the other hand, from the non-quantifiers to go your own way uh, well, I think in the I'm, other direction, too. Yeah, I think I knew uh, mathematics well enough to have worries about the ways in which statistical models were being used, for example, and uh, the claims that were being made for, with even the mathematical models. I, I had problems philosophically justifying some of the methodological preoccupations that were there, and some of the claims, especially the normative claims that were being made in some of those designing models. But again, I was in a mood of great obedience at the time. I was in a strange country, and I was ready to be taught new things. So I did my best to understand what was there. But there was the whole humanity side that <laughs> only needed Marvin Michael to unlock. How did you change, Anne, from obedience to disobedience? Well, I guess I've always been a bit of a rebel theater. <laughs> you know? But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I think, 
I'm still very much the dutiful one on the overall definition of the task, but within it, I will use as much creativity and, and whatever as I can. Right? So it was a question of using some creativity within uh, a defined uh, challenge, rather than necessarily rebelling against the challenge itself. You never felt like a bird in the cage, but anyway, you flew off across the Atlantic, or back across the Atlantic to Belgium, right? Mm. Yes. To, uh, well, maybe you should tell us just briefly about, about your first love, and that is studying the history of geographic thought, thought. in France. I think I can trace that back to both Morgan Thomas and Allman also, and Michael provided the, the inspiration. Uh, they were both very approving of what I was trying to do. See, the course for which I was being trained was a course called Social Geography. And in those days, people heard the term and thought, ugh, you know, <laughs> we never heard of it, or it smacks of anthropogeography and its determinism and stuff we don't want to hear about. But then Marvin said, you know, in Germany and France, and, uh, well, Germany, Sweden, and Holland particularly, that is a term that is, that holds respect. There is a substantial body of literature to be looked at there and so on. So I did look at that, and I presented it at my PhD um, examination. And I think Ullman was the one who said, wouldn't it be neat to have a dissertation on that subject in our department? So, you know, encouraged by that, I went ahead and looked at the French school. But it was entirely on the basis of literature and interlibrary loan and writing to friends all over the world and professors whose articles I had read, you know, please help me type letters. <laughs> I've got to write a dissertation on social geography. And uh, most of them answered in, in the most helpful way. And so I finished the dissertation without ever going to France. And then one day, Allman met me on the stairs and said, uh, you know, we could nominate somebody for a postdoc to Belgium. Have you got any interest or would you be allowed? And uh, I went straight away to find if I could get permission to go and study philosophy in Belgium. I knew that Louvain was a good school and I felt the lack of philosophical training. And to make a long story short, with the help of my friends, I got the fellowship and spent a year in Belgium and had many visits to France during that year. Finished up the book on just the French part of this dissertation during that year. So actually, you could perhaps be called the expert on Francophone, on the Francophone history of geographic thought outside of France and Belgium. Ooh, mm. I, I'd hesitate to say no, that, Peter. Think, no well, way. You're, no. you're modest. I think, no, no, truly, right. truly. I had not, at the time, it was a plain story on the history of ideas, mm. and it was very subjective. I picked up what was attractive to me, and I tried to construe it in a way that my dissertation supervisors would accept as a, as mm. a respectable dissertation. I, it would have taken me years to do it properly, okay? And I wasn't aware of some of the philosophical nuances and questions that I would ask now about that literature. No, but no, I'm talking great. about you, about your stature now. Um, I, don't I think know. if any English-speaking geographer wanted to know something salient about the philosophy of geography in France, if he couldn't go to France or didn't read French, I think he'd he would be well, well advised to come and talk to you, wouldn't he? Well, <laughs> thank you, Peter. I would, be in, I would probably tell them who could really help <laughs> them on that particular question. I yeah. would give them my own hunches, but I don't feel at all that I did a thorough job. And then again, I, I feel if I had, it might have taken 10 years, and people wouldn't know about the tradition. Yeah. Now at least they can be sort of attracted toward a questioning of the tradition because what I wrote was so simple-minded in some ways. It was, it was a description of the... Horizon. But when, when you wrote your uh, uh, thesis on, on French geography, did you see that as somehow being relevant to the modern geography? And how did you counter the argument that French geography was a peculiar product of France and that that whole sort of humanistic approach had really been superseded by modern positivist geography. Mm -hmm. uh, did people sort of suggest that uh, this was a sort of uh, a school that had, was good in its time but was no longer relevant? 
I don't know if they put it exactly as you've put it, Len, but there were many who felt um, if they're worth their salt, they would already have been translated and people would have already picked up the key ideas, you know. One anthropologist told me that. And uh, I still had a conviction that there were dimensions of inquiry which the French had practiced, which were not practiced in the Anglo world and that they needed to be practiced in the Anglo world. Um, you see, I have to go back again to my childhood experience of being an Irish farmer's daughter, right? Growing up in the countryside. And uh, the kind of geography the French were doing was the kind of geography that my country needed to, to be educated in self-understanding, I felt. Much more so than the kind of um, materialistically oriented uh, mapping of form which uh, was being done, I think, in the Anglo world. Eston Evans did a very sensitive work on, on, on my country, and so did Walter Freeman uh, do a very thorough job. But I felt that there was something in the, the prose style and in the general conceptual orientations of, say, Max Soar, uh, which made me feel his approach to la géographie humaine would have been perfect for the kind of experience from which I came. All right, so I felt that some of those were enduring, and one of them was this the beginning of this insider-outsider uh, conception of things, that the residents have a world of experience and the scholar has a world of experience, but the scholar is the one who articulates the description of that place from his own world of training and experience, and it may be quite opaque to the lived experience of those who are actually farmers and fishermen and residents, you see what I mean? So that was the element, I think, that I got from the French school, which I felt would have enduring significance, and argued to that it, in that way. Okay. Uh -huh. yeah. When you went to Belgium, did you find the sort of the philosophy you did there helped you to sort of put some of these ideas in, in, in a sort of philosophical uh, context? Yes. yes, definitely, definitely. You see, the wave at that time was very much phenomenology, existentialism, and the beginnings of hermeneutics, okay? But for me, it was a strange world of thought. But what they were saying was really um, to look at, at what is taken for granted in your models of thought and peel off the layers of cultural and historical and other biases that are there in your conceptions and try to get to the essences of things, okay? Let uh -huh. things speak for themselves. It seemed enormously attractive. It was hard to decode. It was hard to uh, grasp. You know, it was coming to me now in a foreign language, two foreign languages, Flemish and French. Uh, but I tried to digest it and then translate it into some practical uh, mode of expression within geography. But I never felt self-consciously a, a phenomenologist. Uh -huh. you, know you have sometimes been described as a, a humanist geographer, yes. but I understand that that term uh, is not entirely to your liking. Well, I, I am against... Um, ghettoization or, or fragmentation of the geographic enterprise. And I feel that, like I said this morning, when you set up a team to take care of one dimension of geographic inquiry and give it a, its own journal, its own capital letter title and all, then all the other groups leave it to them to be the humanists. And they can be the as gross a technocrat as they want to be uh, and say, oh, well, if you're worried about values or and that philosophy, we have, a, we have a section of our department that takes care of that. Do you see what I mean? And I feel yes. very strongly that everyone who practices geography needs to be aware of the, some of the human dimensions of what they're doing. Okay? Yes. So it's only that I presume that given the sociology of professions, especially now, that's the only way to become visible is to become a special recognizable specialty, but I'm against, I'm against isms, I'm against um, being associated with any one particular clique in the profession, okay? And maybe it's my own feeling about that, the isms and the cliques, rather than this argument I just gave you first, which makes me so opposed to being called humanistic geographer. Was it one of the particular <coughs> values of French geography <clears throat> that uh, it stressed the human aspects particularly in contrast to the, the geographies that developed in other parts of the world, especially the, la géographie yeah. vidalienne, yes. for, for example, was yes. it particularly, quote, human, unquote, 
and therefore appealed to those who cherished a focus on values. Mm -hmm. I think it was more a refusal to separate the human and the physical, okay? Or to get caught in that whole Christian Wissen controversy that split German and Anglo at the time. It felt, I think Vidal believed in the unity of life in the world. That was an a priori stance on his part. And one of the geographer's tasks was to show that in fact there was a, a unity in diversity and that you should look at the forms of human occupants in the context of physical settings without saying that one determined the other. There was a sort of a, a drama of human relations to nature that had to be looked at as a whole. Okay? So you two could have a pretty good fight, couldn't you, with the Fichte and Wissen uh, juxtaposition or idealism, um, whereas I think a, a good idealist uh, then really doesn't want to fuse physical geography with human geography. Uh, you like to separate them. Uh, ide idealism really isn't concerned particularly with geomorphology and climatology and those things. And you, Anne, feel that the whole thing really has to be unified. So there, there really is a, a basic difference between you too, in, in terms of your basic orientation towards the nature of geography? Uh, well, it, I think that uh, you would you'd study a group's occupants of an area in its historical context. So the physical environment would be important, but not our scientific description of that physical environment, but how the people used and classified their own environments. So it's not uh, complete. It, it looks at the physical environment, but in the terms of the categories of the people who used it. But uh, there is a, I think, uh, I see the sort of historical, regional approach as g a attempting to achieve a kind of understanding that is very different from uh, the kind of understanding that the model builders and uh, systems analysts, systems analysts seek to achieve. So I do see a fundamental split within the discipline between people with a sort of historical, cultural, mm. regional orientation mm. and those with uh, an operations research, mm -hmm. uh, quantitative, uh, yes. Yes. Uh, theoretical viewpoint. Yes, yes. Yes, I have no disagreement with, with those distinctions at all, nor am I a Vidalian in the sense of proclaiming the Vidalian doctrine. I have found it inspiring, and it has helped me understand the literature of that period, and I see how appealing it could be for people coming from the background from which I come. But the, my own conception of geography has, has emerged through a number of subsequent experiences as well. Yes. In our conversations yeah. yesterday or today, we really haven't mentioned Emmanuel de Marton at all. Right. Uh, is it just an accident, or is it that you really think of him as, as a, a, minor, a minor geographer, just a son-in-law, maybe? No, uh, he was the heavy, you see, he, and I have a thing about uh, heavies. Huh? Okay. I deliberately don't mention them as often as perhaps they should be mentioned. I think uh, that he was, uh, he was the one who was responsible for, for keeping geography well established after 26 mm -hmm. and so on. He and de Montjean were the big names. And I do give de Montjean a lot of space in that monograph, but I hardly mention de Martin. I gather that he was um, primarily a physical geographer, and he was rather authoritarian and did not have as many students as, say, de Montjean. Uh, I wasn't attracted to, to physical geography at that moment. I didn't perhaps do justice to the physical morphology tradition in the French school. I was interested in human geography. Okay? And I, then, for me, the crucial contrast was between Maxor and de Montjean. And I had no doubt, but Maxor was much more attractive to me than, it, than de Montjean was. And I had this split at the time which I labeled as the ideational versus the artifactual. Okay? And de Montjean was the super artifactualist in a way. He was uh, Carl Sauer and did it better, right? He was the big IGU man who organized committees on this, that, and the other and decided which student thesis was going to get well-reviewed and which wasn't, and so on. But Max Sauer was the, um, in some ways, a bavard. He, he would chat away about little topics of various kinds and so on. But he would always keep the ecological question at the center. 
And I felt that was where the connection between the human and the physical was best made in the French tradition. So he pioneered on medical geography long before the IGU recognized it as an issue. He was talking about the so social structures and uh, the production forces and so on. And he never felt obliged to join any bandwagon, ideological bandwagon, uh, with his fairly critical views of the old artifactual tradition. Okay? So in other words, I, I was very selective in what I said about the French school, and I happened to like Max Soar. Mm -hmm. And I admired Des Mangeons. This was an incredible monument of effort, no doubt about it. But there was something missing by way of that spark that made it hang together, which I found in Soar and didn't find in Des Mangeons. It's a, I will admit it's my own subjective aesthetic choice of two styles of geography. Mm. The genre de vie, of course, is something yes. that you talk about yes. a great deal, yes. which intrigues me because actually one could say that in many regions in France the genre de vie is very similar. It's not the genre de vie that divides France into regions, but it's the physical landscape Maybe you, you might want to contradict me here, but um, it seems to me, maybe we can have a little discussion <laughs> on, along that line for a moment, that as soon as I think about France, I think of the, um, its regional characteristics. Mm -hmm. Normandy, Brittany, the Rhone Valley, the Mediterranean region, the mm -hmm. Massif Central, et cetera, et cetera. And, the, and, the, and I see all these f physical divisions. Mm -hmm and they're based on the physical mm -hmm. um, elements and, uh, and not on genre de vie. De vie because the genre de vie in, 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 in many of these are very similar. Uh, am I, uh, do I lack expertise here? I'm sure you... Don't be, don't, be, <laughs> don't be kind in your answer. No, I just reformulate in some way. If you could say uh, both and rather than either or. Uh, I think the physiographic divisions, the basic fundamental divisions of French soil, about which articles were written in 1900, uh, provide a kind of a skeleton within which different kinds of uh, drama took place. Um, and each, you could speak of a regional genre de vie if it was a pays, for example, that had an internal spatial um, circumference within which there was an identifiable genre de vie. But I didn't think that that was the thing that was open to analytical scrutiny so much mm -hmm. as the livelihood-based genre de vie. And there you could look at the economics of a particular occupation whether it was leather or glass blowing or farming or commercial activity. And you could look at its, its everyday scheduling of activities and the economic and social forces that, that were operating there. You could look at the mentality, values, habits, traditions of work that were there, and you could look at the impact of that livelihood on the physical base. Now, all right, so most of the Breton were paysan. And uh, there was a difference between the, uh, the herders and the pastoralists, the vegetable growers and so on. But um, the fact that the regions were more important than the genre de vie, in your view, could be that there was more homogeneity of livelihood base to genre de vie than, than there is now, okay? But I felt that the livelihood-based one, if you look at it in terms of values and attitudes and beliefs, and also the ecological impact of a genre de vie on the landscape, you had something that was open to analytical scrutiny, and at the same time, something that could give you a more cohesive look at the interaction of man and nature in any particular spot. Isn't this still yes, a, a, a fundamental concept that we could use in yes. studying today's yes. societies I believe so. in modern geography? Yeah. I think analysis of stress, for example, could be elucidated by looking at just an occupation. What we as professors do, you know, how our bodies and heads synchronize on attitudes toward space and time. So we talked about that last night. Yes. That's good. Do you think, Anne, that modern geography um, has something to contribute to knowledge that's very basic? I know it's a very broad question. Uh, I don't I think I'd continue uh, being a geographer if I didn't believe that. Can, yeah. can this be identified and focused on, this, mm -hmm. this yeah. whatever it is that geography contributes to knowledge, yeah. this in, in terms of Verstehen, in terms of the 
understanding uh -huh. of uh, environments. Uh -huh. um, I, I say that I wouldn't continue in geography if I didn't believe that the answer was yes. Uh, but I also say that, that each of us has perhaps a unique type of contribution to make. And I wouldn't dare legislate for the profession as a whole. I, I think I can make uh, statements about what living geographers say they have done. And I can pick out works that have been done, texts that have been produced, which to my mind are edifying, either in terms of self-understanding or understanding the world. Um, I know what I feel would be worthwhile doing now as a geographer, and I'm delighted to have an academic community in which I can continue to, uh, to give and receive and get critique for what I'm doing. But I, I wouldn't dare make a general statement for all geographers to follow. Okay. Now, what is, its, what is the kernel of its contribution? I think um, I have to go around that in various ways. I still put the Socratic thing foremost. Uh, know yourself and know your world, and then begin to understand other worlds. Okay? So you engage in a dialogue which enables you to understand other people's experiences of their world, understanding your own at the same time. I think that's the precondition for any kind of objective discussion about whether we should plan our country this way or that, whether we should invest in this kind of system or that. Uh, I think that this self-understanding and the understanding of other people is the crucial thing that geography can help bring to education. So this self-knowledge is really yes. paramount, and I think this is where both you, Len, and Anne, you very much agree here, right? Yes, yes. Mm. What, what it's the focus, it's really the primary focus in the research of both of you. You're, yours in historical geography, in terms of what you're doing in your research on South Africa, you're, yours in, in the philosophy of, of geography. Yeah, well, w one thing that sort of uh, bothered me about geography in the, in the late 60s and early 70s was that it seemed to lack entirely this dimension. And you could produce models of flows without having any insight into the society that generated these flows. And it, it, it made for what I considered a fairly sterile approach. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if you still think that sort of thing is, is valid or, or how can it be made to, to fit into a broader context. And no, I think that the more we can model that stuff as hypothetical alternatives, and then have a, a critical audience that can make choices on the basis of a very well-delivered set of alternative scenarios, the better. So I feel the education of the audience or the people who are going to be responsible for implementing a particular plan, the more we can educate people to be able to discern among alternatives and see the consequences of particular models and plans, the better. I mean, like, uh, this is from the Glasgow Project. I feel, uh, I felt very bad after that project was over, even though I had tried to deliver a, a picture of how the residents experience uh, a well-planned residential environment as opposed to one that was not well-planned. And I had done all this elaborate um, description of territorial identification and activity networks and all the rest. So I get an elegant article produced, all right, and, and published. But are the residents any better off after I'm gone in being able to cope with the political and the other aspects of their own residential world? No, I just use them to make an elegant article. Maybe the planners could read that and not make the same mistakes again, but in a way I hadn't generated any connections between the, the lived world of residents and the lived world of planners. I was the sort of butterfly that moved in and out and, and gained professionally from the experience. But I also had imposed some of my own biases on what I thought was a desirable plan. I felt privacy, green space, all that, you know, from my Irish background, that all of those should be contained in a, in a residential area plan. I'm not sure the residents really found those things important. So what I'm trying to say is that I would love to get people articulate and, and in a way powerful in being able to discern their own way of life. And if I'm a mediator, I can't be one that isn't dispensable after a certain part of the game. See what I mean? Mm. It's, um, you both yeah. really are involved in rethinking the thoughts of others, except you are thinking about the thoughts of people that are still living, mm -hmm. but you're rethinking the thoughts of people who are now six foot under, right? 
Uh, you examine the manuscripts from the 17th and 18th centuries, right? Um, are these processes comparable? Well, I, I, I see uh, trying to understand uh, the rational actions of people. Uh, you first of all have to, to see these actions within a cultural context and then try and relate what people have done to, the, to, to, to rational decision making. And that will often be, of course, not rational in any modern sense of the term, but it would make sense to the people that, that uh, decided to grow a certain crop in a certain way at that particular time. What uh, the approach does leave out, and here I have some sort of difficulties, I guess, with the phenomenological approach, it does leave out and feels you can never recover the emotions of other people. And yet, uh, I, th I, I feel that the, the phenomenologists are concerned with, with, with uh, getting inside and re-experiencing other people's emotions. Not phenomenologists, I think, so much as maybe existentialists. I, I think phenomenology is basically a philosophy of mind. And Husserl was a mathematician, and he still was into that enlightenment certainty that one could find the foundations of knowledge in these pure essences, right? That was his vision, in a way. I think existentialists were much more interested in, in the business of living, anxiety, hope, despair, you know, emotion, that kind of thing. But I think phenomenology would bracket out the emotional component in its search for the truth and the eidetic essence. Right? Okay. For the benefit of our yeah. viewers, uh, maybe we could just have a moment about, about perhaps a definition of phenomenology versus existentialism <laughs> might, be, might be in order because there's so much confusion about this, especially after Colin Wilson's books and others, and, 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 and there seems to be quite a bit of disagreement. I, I don't know whether you'd like to def give your own definitions uh, or whether you'd like to give an example, but just be sure that we understand exactly what the concepts are that you're talking about. Would you like to def define phenomenology and existentialism? Would you lend? Especially since now people are talking about phenomen phenomenological existentialism and existential, existential phenomenology. Yes. Um, and these again have very special yeah. meanings. Am I getting a little in, okay. getting getting in too deep here, or we, we won't be able to give a satisfactory uh. definition? It seems to me in a minute. Uh. But the, the, some of the crucial, the most helpful thing is to look at some prototypical exponents of each, mm. and then show that there are there are all kinds of intermediate types. People who come from both streams and create something new. I think Husserl could be, in a way, taken as a prototypical phenomenologist, right. and he he displays that preoccupation with consciousness, okay, uh, which is still very much linked with Kantian foundations and idealism and the human subject as author of thinking, okay, and that the, the foundations, he's not going to eradicate foundations, he's going to find more solid ones, which would enable all the sciences to be able to carve out their specific uh, domains without getting trapped in the various isms, like psychologism, sociologism, historicism, and so on. And he felt that those foundations could be made if we had done the reduction to eidetic essences, the essences of things. And we could let phenomena speak for themselves. Sudensack, and that was his big thing. Go to the so this was a, a, a trip that was concerned with thought and truthfulness. Now, uh, I think existentialism comes from much more a moralistic and ethical background, uh, where you are concerned with matters of life and meaning and significance and hope and despair. It has to do with living and being and becoming more than it does necessarily with truth. Now, it happens that several individuals, like Marcel uh, Jaspers, uh, Merleau Ponty, these people were had inspiration from both streams and they created something new <laughs> with it. But I think that, that's the crucial distinction as I see it. And I, you may look at it differently. Well, yeah. uh, not, not from a, in, a, in a philosophical context, but looking at the work that, that has been labeled phenomenological within geography, mm -hmm. it seems that perhaps it should, would be better named existential mm -hmm. because the author seems to get involved in, in, in presenting a particular point of view or re regretting that uh, peasant life has passed, mm. regretting the, yes. the placelessness of modern society, yes. so that it doesn't seem to f fit into the sort of 
objectivity that mm -hmm. Husserl seemed to have been aiming for. Right, right. And I think that, but that is not of the essence of the field. I think authors bring their own baggage of ideological preference to the phenomenological procedure and dub it accordingly. You can have Marxist existentialists and Christian, Christian existentialists who uh, disagree ideologically but still find existentialism as a mode of approaching knowledge which is attractive to them. Okay? So I think that people, and especially in this country, I, I think that many people use the word without ever reading the, uh, the original authors. It has become a kind of convenient label in which to dump any and all kinds of critique sometimes. And um, then there is a missionary uh, aspect to some of the work that's written on alienation and so forth, which, uh, which others may call phenomenological, but I think which Husserl would turn in his grave if he recognized. So I think that that's the accident of, of language and translation. Um, if, so. if we did, uh, so would you think that uh, if somebody was attempting to, to present an objective account of, of how people uh, experience the world, then it's up to the other geographers to criticize that work where they see an individual subjectivity intruding, because although we, we might all uh, try and uh, be as objective as possible, and, and inevitably our background will affect what we have to say. Is it the proper task of the sort of the community of geographers to engage in a, in a critical discourse to try and uh, point out where subjectivity enters and to try and create a more uh, objective uh, understanding of, of how people... Uh, there's no doubt about it. One of the reasons I like to stay in geography is that I can count on critique and, you know, this sort of thing. But I think if you are sharing uh, varieties of objective assessment of a body of data, you're not doing phenomenology. You're, you're doing objective science. You're in the observer stance, okay? The true phenomenological account would be authored by the people concerned. Or you would get indicators of that through poetry, art, other kind of artifact. But you wouldn't take it upon yourself to write that story on behalf of. I see. Okay? I yes. think that's the crucial difference. Yes. Mm. yes. Now, this, this, this is another uh, problem, I guess, in terms of uh, geography uh, as, a, as a discipline, is uh, aren't, isn't it important for us to, to establish a body of knowledge? Uh, and if everybody was sort of their own geographer, they might have something very interesting to say about their own reactions to places, mm -hmm. but out of that, there, there wouldn't emerge any uh, uh, body of knowledge, but there would emerge a body of uh, personal impressions, uh, well, travel reactions to travel and things like that. One doesn't know that yet. One can't predict that, I think, a priori, because we haven't done it. But I don't think Freud would ever have been able to erect a theory of a psychoanalysis if he didn't believe that from individual accounts some generalizations would emerge. And I think Bachelard says that uh, topoanalysis might be even more insightful than psychoanalysis in gaining self-understanding. What he meant was, if you really look at the places in your life, and your experiences of places, it can tell you a great deal about yourself. It can tell you even more than what a Freudian psychoanalyst can get from you uh, through his battery of questions about your parents, your background, your, your psychological development. So uh, in, that's a minimal answer to your first question. What does a geographic, um, what does geography have to contribute? I think in terms of this really important reflection on the places in which you've lived, the journeys through which you've come. Uh, you can gain an understanding of your own preconceptions about the world. And until you've gained that, there's no way that you can talk about objectivity, it seems to me. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. Uh, but would you envisage sort of uh, taking or trying to get an understanding of subjective uh, views of different places and then uh, take it a step further to try and generalize some, some, some common held, commonly held ideas? Absolutely, and I think this is possible in the analysis of historical texts as well as contemporary texts. If you look at them all as interpretations, and if we had a handle on how to, how to look at interpretations, um, 
we'd be already on the way to, to being able to bridge this enormous gulf between insider and outsider. See, I think that what's happened in the last 10 years since the Belgian experience and so on, I'm moving beyond that polarity that seemed to be so comfortable and so pedagogically effective and all. Uh, you have subjective and objective, you know, and in which camp do you belong sort of thing. Uh, but what I've really been looking for through all this dialogue with the Swedes and you know, the humanist technocrat dialogue is to find um, uh, dimensions on which there can be a tuning in to each other's wavelengths. And I find that uh, in the world of symbols, okay, symbolic uh, transformations of, of data to words, to maps, to, to models, in that area of symbol making, I think there is a fundamental uh, dimension of humanness and that when people tell of their experiences of places, they will tell it using symbols. Some people use poetry, some pictures, some music, some words. Um, you will find symbols, among which are metaphors, <laughs> uh, which can enable insider and outsider to grasp what is being discussed. Okay? So it's, in a way, I see a, a movement away from the literalness, the unequivocalness of this objective language of mathematics and so on, and the extreme, the potential for extreme subjectivity on this part, to meet on a common ground of symbol making. And in what symbols uh, can we really build bridges between different interpretations of the world? So that's why I'm so keen on metaphor right now. <laughs> yes, we will be talking yeah. about that yeah. in just a few moments because I think we ought to discuss a little bit about some of the research you've been doing mm -hmm. on the various types of metaphors and to, to what extent they can be related to some of the epistemologies that, that we've been talking about. Maybe this will be a good time for us to take a short break and then uh, after that we can perhaps start in on just discuss some of the um, the relationship of some of the epistemologies to each other and then the root metaphors <laughs> on which um, Anne has been working so diligently. So let's take a break right now and then reconvene in about 10 minutes. Grand. <laughs> Thank good. you. We've had a little break now during the first hour here with Dr. Anne Buttermer and Dr. Leonard Gelke, we discussed first Dr. Buttermer's background, her journey from her youth, her education, to her geographical studies and her current research. And then we discussed somewhat her current ongoing research some of her philosophical views. At this point, I think we should examine somewhat what the various epistemologies in geography are all about. And this is, here are some questions I would like to ask you, Anne, and you also, Len. Although you're already somewhat acquainted and not just superficially with, with my views. It is more and more difficult for geographers to think about the nature of what they're doing, uh, to decide whether or not to, they belong to any particular school of thought. Even when we examine ourselves, it is very difficult for us to ask ourselves the question, what philosophy do I embrace? Uh, with what epistemology do I identify? In earlier days, it was much easier. In fact, our intellectual forebears weren't bothered by this question. Humboldt, Ritter, Heckner, Ratzel, even Hartshorn really weren't bothered by this very difficult question at all. Well, first there were dichotomies, and then later on there was a three-party system. 
geography was described as in terms of paradigms, especially after Kuhn's book appeared. But now everybody's talking about epistemology. In a recent attempt, I tried to make a chart which showed 10 epistemologies in a reasonably logical order. I won't list them all at this point. And then 10 criteria for evaluation. And um, so I had a grid of 100 squares. And fortunately, I was able to put something in each particular square, which says something about what kind of a geographer I am. And you can comment on that later. Uh, I think we've already indicated that it shows a little bit of that I'm somewhat of an Apollonian in some way. It shows some of some achistic training. Um, it um, it also has an implication here of a grill. I'm, first, I thought of the the French word grill, which has one meaning, but you can also think of a grill of a prison, of a of a, a prison door. And I don't want to be imprisoned by this particular. Uh, analogy. But the, the uh, problem really is each epistemology can be described and analyzed. It can be defined just like a few moments ago you define phenomenology and existentialism. What does make it really difficult is when somebody says the asks the question, what really is the difference between phenomenology and existentialism? And then we get these more minute points that, that interfere. Now, the questions I'd like to ask you, Anne, here, the questions that really bother me is, um, A, is this kind of exercise uh, useful. You've, you've, you've seen the grid, and you've seen some of the papers I've written. B, um, is it, uh, does it uh, help towards better understanding of what geography is all about? Does it help the question at all when one asks, what am I? Uh, must, must the geographer be a monist and say, this is, I am a positivist, or I am a Marxist, or I'm a phenomenologist? Do you, is it like belonging to a political party? Or, or do, you, or do you say, I'm 20% this, or 30% that, or 40% that? Especially when I feel, once in a while, that there are changes within me between morning, afternoon, and evening. And this <coughs> then makes me very guilty, because I feel I'm a little wishy-washy about my, my attitudes towards the field about which I'm very fond. These are questions that seem almost irrelevant to some of my colleagues, but I feel in you, Anne, and in you, Len, I feel people who are somewhat sympathetic to this kind of soul searching, and I'd like to hear what you would answer to this uh, very personal type of question. Who wants to go first? <laughs> okay. I, I hate to spring this on you like this. <laughs> yes, I, well, there, there are several questions wrapped up in it, I think, Peter, and uh, let me give you some sort of off-the-cuff responses. Um, I think I've been through the trip of trying to examine my conscience for many years, uh, but I have never really felt the need to, to be labelable in a precise category. Uh, that's true on positions about women in geography. It's true on positions about idealism, materialism. 
internalist versions of the history of ideas, external, and so on. I see it all as a kind of theater, and I'm part of the theater, okay? I'm not looking at it, observing it from the outside, nor am I getting a camera to look at myself. I, we are part right now of an ongoing kind of drama. And uh, the actors are these isms. And how we relate to them is a matter of how much self-confidence we have in our own way of construing things. Is geography a game and we're now watching what's going on in the arena? No, we're part of it, it seems to me. And uh, it depends whether you mean game in the Wittgenstein sense or you mean it in a more loose sense. I see it all as, as drama and it's unfolding. And what worked yesterday to categorize the, the other actors in the stage may not work today. I, I'm very much a um, pragmatist in, in the sense of categories and labels. But I also shy away from it. I must say I have a great uh, hostility against the business of, of isms and categories, even though I use it in teaching as a, an entree, an initial uh, housekeeping of the, the mess. And then I begin to demolish the idea of categorical distinctions between things. Students okay. should be taught what these epistemologies are. Uh, well, yes, insofar as they are, they are part of our heritage and they have been, they have presented themselves under those rubrics, then at mm -hmm. least one needs to know what the filing labels are. Mm -hmm. But to assign them any kind of ontological status or any perennial value as channels for future thinking, I am very much a skeptic on that. So that's my second set of reactions. It is to look at the nature of geography epistemologically. Um, I, I don't do that. I see the epistemological claims as one, one of the many claims made for explanatory effect, let's say, when we try to explain something. We use epistemological argument, epistemologically grounded arguments as, as one appeal to an audience. They say, hey, this has been derived in a logically consistent and well-grounded way, and you can evaluate my results in terms of the process through which I have, I have screened this evidence and so forth. But you see, there's a, there's a prior question to that, and that is, uh, what has geography been concerned about in the pre-discipline era, <laughs> during the discipline era, and what will it be concerned about when we no longer have disciplines as we know them now? And I see that coming rapidly. And that is a sort of curiosity about the way humans have made a home on the earth. Now, making a home involves more than clear thinking. It involves intuition, it, may, it involves tradition, it involves an assessment of uh, what the resources of the area can take. It, it involves a lot of um, other human talents uh, and imagination beyond that which is scrutinizable via epistemological roots. Okay? And now whether it's good or bad, right or wrong, what we've inherited is a kind of um, a bifurcation of the truth instinct. I mean, the, the drive toward clear statements, truthful statements on the one hand, and the drive toward making something work practically on the other. It's a bit of the Socratic split of truth and being, right? And I think geography has always been caught in an area where you not only have to make yourself respectable in truth-making, but you also have to uh, attune yourself to what works in a particular situation, okay? So the practical has always been, it seems to me, for all the geographers I've listened to, uh, the practical affairs of uh, the ec economy, the transport system, the settlement layout and all that, a practical business is quite as important as making a statement which uh, an epistemologist would find inscrutable in terms of its internal logics. Do you see what I mean? Yes. So I see a need to look at geography in it's a different way. It's not a matter then that I shouldn't call these words epistemologies. It's much deeper than the overall nomenclature that I've given it. Anyway, I would, as I would yeah. be inclined to approach geography with a, with a less um, explicit set of isms, I think. I might not approach it in terms of isms either, you know? Yeah. It's, um, these are constituted bodies of thought and, and institutionally they've had audiences and producers that go on reproducing within those labels. But I'm not sure that I'm terribly impressed about their relevance to us, okay? I, I, maybe that's the rebel in me, but uh, we, there's a quotation I read recently which said, history and geography, disciplines that are not yet elevated or reduced to the status of science, are inevitably, in those disciplines, thought is inevitably caught in the linguistic mode. 
the mode in which it articulates itself. Now, there's an awful lot more to that than the logics of a particular intellectual process. There's more to it than the vernaculars, okay? There's a lot of literary style, there's a lot of ideological implication, and there's a lot that is simply symbol creation. How do you symbolize the feeling of being at home in a place? How do you find words for that that will be understood by an epistemologist? He will want to reduce it to its parts, but if a geographer can understand another geographer as he says that, and if the people who live in a place can understand it, isn't it just as valuable a form of symbol making as, you know, a mathematical equation? Well, there's, there is a, an, a geographic epistemology that like, would like to, to, to see uh, geography re reduced to almost symbolic logic, sure. right? Sure. Um, Len, as, as a proponent of idealism, how do you feel about what well, Anne and I have been talking about? I know you feel rather strongly about your particular philosophical thrust. Um, do, do you feel that this is something that is just a matter of language, or do you think it's much broader than that? Well, I think it, it, it's, it's a much deeper issue. And I also think it's a very important issue because if we can try and put our work within some epistemology, then within that particular epistemology there will be certain rules which our work should, should uh, conform to. And if our work is not consistent with some of the underlying uh, bases of the epistemology, then something is wrong. So I, I think that by trying to, uh, to look at our work from the point of view of uh, what, what status does it have in terms of its, its knowledge, it can perform a, a very useful function. And if I can give an example of that, uh, take for example uh, the positivist uh, epistemology. Uh, in in essence, its uh, laws and theories are very important to this epistemology, and therefore anybody that's operating within positivism should have a very clear idea about what a theory is and, and how, it, how it works, what laws are. Otherwise, you can easily end up in, in, in the situation, uh, for example, of environmental determinism being a sort of overarching theory which can never be disproved and really hasn't got any explanatory power, but the workers who accept implicitly that the environment influenced societies never really questioned it uh, because there, there was something wrong with their methodology. And the same applies to the, uh, the more recent spatial theory. I think that if people had had a more philosophical uh, education and, and, and they would have seen the limitations of of what they were doing. Now, it doesn't mean that they would have stopped doing it. it. It means they might have reclassified it as pragmatism. They might have made less staggering claims for what they could achieve. So I really, for me, uh, uh, sort of, I think that the truth element is, 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 is crucial. And I think that in searching to find something, in searching to make true statements, you have to get into a, a, a very uh, you have to get into epistemologies. And that was my route into the sort of, uh, and into philosophy, was, was a concern about uh, claims that were being made at the time and whether they could be substantiated, and also a search for <coughs> an approach that I felt could yield results that I could say, okay, I think this is, I'm going to, attempt to produce a true account of something. Uh, that was important. But at the same time, and uh, somewhat of a paradox, I would admit that no fully true account can ever be given. But I think it's important that we aim at providing true accounts because that is a basis on which criticism becomes possible and people can criticize you if they feel you've made an untrue statement. And this immediately implies your statements are based on, on evidence. And this led me into the sort of, into the philosophy of history, 
where historians have had a lot of experience dealing with, with evidence. And they, the historians generally, try to make true statements about the past on the basis of interpretation of evidence. And yet, you can get debates about what really happened in the past among historians who would interpret evidence in different ways. This kind of debate where, you, where you're looking at a body of, of evidence, maybe from different points of view, I think can be creative. It's a very creative kind of debate because uh, you both have an, an idea of trying to provide a true account of something and you can debate what the meaning of particular evidence is in that context. And, and that through, by that route, I sort of drifted into to idealism, first reading uh, R.G. Collingwood, who was, who was required reading in, in most uh, sort of history and philosophy of history courses, and also in, in historical geography, uh, where I uh, was uh, studying with Cole Harris at the University of Toronto. But uh, Collingwood is, is quite difficult to understand, and the, the first, one's first acquaintance with his philosophy tends to be, there's a lot in it that seems to be paradoxical or, or simply uh, untrue, but uh, I found, I, I've sort of got deeper into his, his philosophy and I feel that it does provide a basis on which historical geographical problems can be approached. And of course Collingwood represents a, 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 a whole stream of European philosophical thought. Uh, so that it's not just one individual, but he, 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 he represents uh, a much, uh, a sort of a, 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 an idealist stream of, of European philosophical thought, which, and just to sort of briefly uh, identify some of the main elements in his philosophy, the one was that he felt that uh, research in history had been distorted by the model of the natural sciences. So his first task was to, to, to break clean of the natural sciences, to recognize there was something fundamentally different about human societies. And what was fundamentally different about human societies was that uh, man has made his own society through his own mental efforts. And on that basis, he developed the idea that you should rethink thoughts if you wanted to understand uh, societies. You have to, to see what problems individuals and societies faced at particular times. You have to see these problems in their historical context and then rethink the thoughts. And in that way, each, each generation, so to speak, uh, inherits the past and then adds to it. So that Collingwood saw history as a, as a dialectical process but not dialectical materialism, uh, a, a, a dialectical of ideas where, uh, where... And there was never ever a time when you could start again. Uh, we can't stop and say, let's rerun history another way, because we, we are all trapped in, in, in historical circumstances. Doesn't this almost have a religious overtone? And uh, I... One could, I suppose, hear that. I didn't hear it. <laughs> I, I wasn't listening for that part of it, but there's no question, a, but that is that it's, part it's of it. It's a strong conviction, a strong strong mm. belief, but a, a, a very logic-tight one, right? Yes, uh, it, it simply it deals more with method, I would say, than with some of the metaphysical questions that you brought up first. And that's my problem with it, um, that it doesn't go back far enough, it seems to me. Um, the stance. The method and the metaphysics are No, I think that mixed? during the era when positivism uh -huh. took over, uh, anything that wasn't of method was trivialized. One couldn't ask questions about what is the nature of history, what is the nature of society, and those sorts mm -hmm. of things. You asked, how can I deliver a truthful statement, given the data that's unequivocally you know, This is very things. interesting. In, in the new book that has just come out, Themes in Geographic Thought, in which Lynn has a chapter. I don't know whether you've I've seen... I've seen it yet, and unfortunately, no. Um, there's a chapter on positivism which gives you a test. Mm -hmm. uh, to, are, you, are you not a... Or have you ever been a positivist? Uh -huh. <laughs> ten, ten true-false questions. And um, 
you can it can be self-administered uh -huh. and um, I've administered it to myself and I found that yeah. I'm much more of a positivist than I thought I would be but most people are yes. I think it's our yes. early training our time, yes. um, most people score between six and eight uh -huh. on that test but the reason I just happen to think of it is that most of the questions in their test, and correct me if I'm wrong, Len, are concerned with method. Yes. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They are. They yeah. are. And so I think you're right in what you're saying, that, that, there's, that the emphasis is on, on method and not on the metaphysical, yes. metaphysical aspects. Yeah, and I heard you asking a question that included more than questions of method. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And I think that means we have to peel back a few more layers yes. on, on, on history to get a, an insight into that. You know? Maybe we should start now peeling back these layers and ask you a little bit about more about what you've been doing over the last two or three years and, and, and have you tell us about your four root metaphors. <laughs> I think they're very exciting metaphors. Uh, I won't steal your thunder and name them, but I'll let you go through them one by one and, and maybe we will, maybe we won't interrupt you, but I think you should mention each one and what you mean by them and then maybe we can just talk about your four metaphors. Hmm? Okay. okay. And because I, I think uh, they, 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 in tandem with some other classifications, give us a much deeper understanding of what geographic knowledge is all about. Mm. I hope maybe, yes. Mm. I don't think I'll be able to tell everything of what I've been up to in the last two years, but mm. we can just, just introduce metaphor yeah. in Let, the context. Let's introduce yes. metaphors okay. as such. All right, so I, I sort of am very agnostic about this positive era and philosophy of science that only looks at method in a way. Uh, and I go back to, to issues like what is the nature of human occupants of a place? Um, how does one, how do people make a home in particular places, right? How do they name it? How do they claim it? How do they use it? And how do they distribute it among society and all that? Okay, I ask a question that has to do with uh, the nature of man, the nature of society and so on. And uh, I'm very impressed with Suzanne Langer's assertion that beyond all these uh, caption labels we have for mankind as homo ludens, homo rationale, homo economicus, all these other captions. She, said, she says, what is most specifically human of all living forms is this desire to create symbols, is the symbol-making capacity. Okay? So people create symbols around which they can organize collective life. These may be sonic, visual, artistic, whatever, it can be words and languages. And one very advanced form of symbol making is metaphor. You notice if you decode the toponymy of a, a place, you, you see how many parts of the human body are already uh, ascribed to mountains, valleys, feet, the mouth of a river, the feet of a glacier, the, fo the forehead, the chin, the face of the earth, <laughs> okay. Uh, the geographic symbols we use, the words we use to talk about the earth are words taken from our own bodies, okay. Especially, so, um, if we look at the history of geographic thought, certainly we have it in physical geography, yes. like William Morris Davis and, okay. and his erosion yes. cycle. We have it with yes. with uh, with uh, Ratzel and, yes. and Lebensraum yes. and etc. These are all these are all metaphors, are they not? I think so. Yeah, but even before we got a discipline and chairs and universities and all that, nation-state baptism, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I'm sure that people everywhere have, have made a home in their local surroundings uh, and, and passed that, the code on with symbols. A lot had to do with neighborhood definition, with cardinal direction, with uh, the calendar and all the rest. These are a set of symbols that enabled a preliterate society to pass on the wisdom of life to the next and so on and so forth. Now long comes uh, specialist castes to, uh, to analyze and scrutinize these ways of living and, and even make some normative statements about the future. And my question is, how well have we t attuned ourselves to what mankind has learned in history about living with the earth? Or how much are we simply articulating what our discipline taught us to regurgitate and so on? So I look at these symbols and uh, I'm nowhere toward starting point yet, but at least this system of metaphors that I've picked up, I've basically taken from Stephen Pepper, who's done a history of aesthetics using these 
this notion of world hypotheses. His claim is he's a disciple of Dewey, so he comes out of the pragmatist tradition, which isn't exactly uh, too metaphysically oriented, but he says everybody establishes a, a sense of world out of common sense experience. And once that is established, he or she will tend to look at other things in terms of that world view. Okay? Too long this to elaborate. very idealist. Okay, yes, yes, yeah, I think so. But it, he has given it this contextual slant because he's, like he's on the Dewey wavelength, okay? Uh -huh. Right, so um, this would be something a positivist wouldn't touch. You know, and I don't think a positivist would even listen because a positivist is not interested in looking at what the presuppositions are behind what his grand technology of truthful statement delivery is. <laughs> okay, so, um, all right. So, um, to skip over a number of the intervening stages, I, he suggests that there are these four world hypotheses which he feels are relatively adequate in claiming a version of what the world's all about. Right? Uh, there are others, like animism, mysticism, and others, which he dismisses because they, they aren't what he calls cognitively responsible. They haven't a complete picture that you can justify epistemologically. So these four he calls organicism, Okay. And its root metaphor is the organism. And anybody can have an experience of owning his or her own body, right? So there's an organism there in common sense. And you can see uh, local regions as organisms, at least that was what we did at one time in history, uh, Lebensraum and Heimatskunde, uh, and seeing that as microcosm of, of a larger thing. In plant ecology and in health, uh, these, this metaphor of world made cognitive sense but it also made sense in terms of living and uh, the, the ideal way to live, okay? A second one he talks about is formism. This is very much the Socratic, Platonic idea that in the form of something, you can discover the nature of the thing, okay? You have the shape, the pattern, and then you have a norm underlining it, underlying it. So I associate our chorological phase with this. It's the, the map is its central instrument, but if you use the word map metaphorically, you're getting at the view of the world I'm painting. It's a world, a mosaic of different patterns, you know, and no overriding global cosmos into which all of these patterns have to fit. So that's the second. This is now analytical, where <coughs> the first is synthetic. synthetic. Right. right? Yes. And the first was integrated, and the second is dispersed. Yes. Okay? But the map, um, we can go into when it came to be popular and so forth, but it is a reaction against the kind of absolutist claims and some of the mystical associations of, of organicism. It was much more matter-of-fact, on the ground, you could map it, measure it, and you could get critique from your colleagues about whether your measurement was right, okay? Uh, but on organism, a lot of it was poetry, it was belief, it was national identity, it was... It appealed to other uh, kinds of cred credence than just its logical character. Um, the third is mechanism. That doesn't need a great deal of elaboration, I think. Uh, many of our mappers moved easily into mechanism, pattern to, pr process, pattern to process or form to function. The integrated ma models of the 60s are, it seems to me, an expression of a, a combination of those two metaphors. And the last <coughs> one is <coughs> excuse me, the arena or the drama. <laughs> uh, Pepper calls it contextualism. And I think to translate the spirit of that into geography, uh, I identify it as a world as arena of special events. You only make claims about your description of specific events, right? And no overriding general formula. Now, uh, this is a macro meta scheme, and it has not been derived empirically from thousands of autobiographies. No, it was read in a book by somebody and then applied. Uh, here is, you know, in a way, to the literature of those schools from which my authors have come. Because I wanted to see, is there a way I can look at the relationship between a particular author and his or her times, okay? And I needed a way of looking at the times, the context, okay, that was a little more efficient than those isms we learned in the textbooks. And so I have looked for the, the relative dominance of one or other of these in, say, the German or the French school at a particular time and see whether my author was in the middle of a wave or at the edge trying to establish a new one and so on. Okay. So I, I find it a useful way uh, to think of an advanced stage of symbolizing the business of living on the earth 
what the earth is all about. Okay? And um, it's not a way of rubricizing authors, because most creative thinkers move among metaphors, and I think most vibrant schools of thought have had all four simultaneously playing. They're like actors on the stage, and at some periods, one is more dominant than the other. Uh, you mentioned uh, yesterday that uh, organism metaphor was, was dominant before the First World War, or was, very, was not necessarily dominant, but, but uh, many geographers were, were working within that metaphor, which mm. seemed to, to drop off in importance at the end of the war yes. as a result of that war? Well, not necessarily as a result, but I think as uh, perhaps a reflection of um, respon response that scholars made to the kind of imperialistic claims and, and a world war that had come from um, different societies that had construed themselves as the apex of the organic process. Okay. Yes. So uh, I think that organicism suits an empire within the empire to show, in fact, that the central head, the apex of the world is the capital city, whether it's London or Paris or Berlin. Okay? And then you had a world war because organic unities couldn't communicate in any language under the sun except war, it seems to me. And so the, the, the op organicism, I think, was associated with absolutism in, in politics. <clears throat> it was associated a bit with Darwinianism. And, and with environmental determinism. And uh, I think that for those reasons, which were social and political in nature, this mode, this metaphor, as a claim to truth, lost its credibility. But I find that a little disturbing, because mm. it seems to be that uh, the truth content is related to the social and political context, yes. and it hasn't really got uh, much to do with the metaphor itself, whether the metaphor was uh, was adequate, mm. but rather just it was a fashion that suited that particular milieu. Yes. And when that milieu uh, went changed. out of being or changed, so did the, the, the kind of metaphors that uh, geographers operated within. As, as what occupied the airspace in the community at that time. Now, I, my thesis is that it was always latent and continues to be a latent uh, motif in geographic thought. Uh, but that was the moment of its glory, in a way, and I think literature, uh, history writing, uh, home area studies um, helped it to stay popular during that period. There was no shock to the world that believed itself to be microcosm of a macrocosm. Okay? And I think the World War brought a great shock. So you see, perhaps in contrast with you, I see a constant interplay of the truth claims and the practical material claims of relevance, right? There's always the <clears throat> interplay of the drive of a metaphor toward uh, truthfulness, convi convincing, convincing people of its value, yeah. regardless of whether this is Australia, Japan, or Europe, versus the, the inevitable need to relate this to milieu. From what you say, then, Actually, there is some correlation between metaphors and epistemologies because a, a number of metaphors are very closely linked to certain types of, of course. epistemologies, of course. and I can almost see a, a cube uh -huh. <laughs> uh, at the base. So we have this, this 10 by 10 grid, right? Yes. The epistemologies and the criteria for evaluation or analysis. And on top, I can see your four metaphors uh -huh. and, and these various flows uh, over time. And I can see uh, in the middle, again, time and the epistemologies. And, and one can see t to what extent uh, there is a congruence uh -huh. of uh, a s certain types of uh, metaphors with certain types of epistemologies. Does Absolutely. that make, does that oh, make yes, sense yes. to you? Yes, and I think as Pepper uses metaphor, and I'm not particularly sold mm. on the way he uses it, he uses it to, to lay the foundations for an epistemological argument, for the reliability mm. of a way of knowing, rather than the, the moral appeal or the aesthetic appeal of mm. a way of life, you see what I mean? So he is, he is orienting it all toward cognitive credibility. And therefore, he is anxious to make it a foundation for epistemology. Now let's go one step further. All these various epistemologies um, 
have also visions of the future. Mm -hmm. um, do, uh, do you feel that these visions of the future can be uh, correlated at all with certain types of um, with these certain types of metaphors that you've been talking about? I'm sure they're there in that some of them take time seriously and take mm. history seriously and others don't. I mean a contextualist is, is rather casual about that and the, the grid of time measurement changes with the event, right? Um, the, uh, the formist would look at the future as a Platonist would, in a way. The forms change, you know, you don't question the macro structures, you just see each form emerging in its own, trying to reach its own end, because every form has its own built-in end. The mechanist, it seems to me, would very much be concerned with policing the future, in a way, predicting it and arranging for the machine so it doesn't run off the edge anywhere, and mm -hmm. make sure it's, it's integrated enough to accommodate anything that could be variable in the future. And the organicist, I think, does not take uh, time in, a, in the chronological sense. I think it looks at levels of integration already achieved. So right? it would be really the Promethean versus the Protean, in a way. I think that's close. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that may be close. Yes. Yes. Uh, last year, we had a course, a geography course, fourth year geography course, and the topic, I'm going to spring this on you, the topic <laughs> was uh, the geography of settlement in outer space. Do you think this is a valid course for students in geography to, to think about settlement in outer space? I know we haven't talked about this at all, uh -huh. I'm springing this on you, but as long as we're just bouncing around, uh, how do you feel about this? Well. I would ask, is the thing worthwhile, humanly speaking? You know, I wouldn't ask whether it's appropriate for a geographer to ask it. I would ask it in terms of knowledge generally. Mm -hmm. What is the value of this flight of speculation? Mm -hmm. And what might the technological implications of whatever results be? I think I would go at it in, in other ways besides, is it appropriate for geographers to be involved in it? Would, perhaps it is, is it appropriate for anybody to involve, in, engage well, in future speculation about... Uh, uh, yes, in a way, yes, but, but you know how science fiction can shape what actually technology will do, and I'm, I'm a bit suspicious about the way in which science fiction has actually shaped the little bit of history that I've walked through and the consequences of some of it. Because I think if you... If the mind can speculate on all kinds of things, uh, if, you, if it isn't harnessed in a way with the need to make it practically uh, useful and in a way that isn't dangerous to other forms of life. Okay? So the expansionary uh, philosophy, the frontier philosophy of future studies has been, to my mind, quite irresponsible in some ways. But it's put ideas in the heads of technologists who have created consumer needs that we all go out and buy then. And, yeah. It isn't necessarily leading to a more harmonious way of living with this fragile earth of ours. It is opening the doors for more escapism and uh, frontierism that uh, enables us to forget the mess we've made and the mess we need to tidy up. So I wouldn't personally get involved in such a course. Could you because also call it the laboratory? Could, could you call it a laboratory on how, really, how to really make it work? In outer and space? Stu and, and study some of the conditions that our planet, uh, that we could find, uh, could develop on our planet if, if we strove towards an ideal condition. To do the lab out there and then come yeah. back and try to implement it? Mm -hmm. oh, I think we have plenty experience of doing that right here. And we never bring it into uh, fulfillment, bring some of them to fulfillment. Well, I mean, regulating climate, so regulating uh, daylight, uh, regu regulating uh, soil conditions, vegetation, gravity, all kinds of other things. I would be happy about pushing forward the frontiers of whatever analytical game one want, wishes to push if I felt that we were also educating ourselves morally and socially about how to use whatever we find out. I think that the story has not been a lack of imagination in technical ingenuity 
and analytical frontier pushing. Where we've lacked, and this is a geographic sense that's telling me this, is the, the human capacity to, to use what we know wisely. Let's suppose in discussions focused on who should, go, who should um, be selected to go to live on, in a space colony and what legal system should be developed, what, um, uh, what should be considered crimes, what, 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 it, should there be any punishments, um, all these other uh, related activities. Um, I'm not sure I would be involved. Too far, too far out. In a way, yes. I, I, I well, just, it, push, it pushes the, the mechanist metaphor yes. pretty far when, you, when you're sort of structuring the, yes. the column. Well, I, I think that's uh, I just have to think to about it when we're talking about uh, the, the mechan mechanistic aspects, mechanistic, mechanistic aspects of it. Yes. Yes, I think that's true. But I, I would also fear a, a pre-ordained experiment of human living. I mean, you can pre-ordain and pre-design some of the technical and environmental considerations, but, but can you leave room for uh, people to create society, uh, create community, and create a co-responsible attitude toward making it work? Um, the thing that is so tragic about the dream and reality of some of our social engineering experiments is that not enough room is left for uh, evoking co-responsible uh, and creative community building on the part of the people who are supposed to live there. You know, if you ask me, would you go if you were, who sh how should we select? I mean, <laughs> are you assuming there'd be some alphabetical list or some, you know, printout of bio whatever of individuals and then you find the suitable team and fly them out there I think that would be a, a recipe for failure to begin with well but the question is how should it be done supposing we we could send uh, uh, 5,000 human humans into into space to a space colony uh, well, how should they be selected take a look page from history how did the New England people do it the community in a way was formed in the process of moving. Okay. At least you didn't, you didn't say Australia. <laughs> <laughs> the wild colonial or, boy. <laughs> or the African slaves, of course, in right. the New World. Right, yes. I would find it a bit appalling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, a few days ago, uh, we had a lecture given to us here at the university uh, on the grasshopper. Yes. It was a recapitulation on the old Aesop fable on the grasshopper and the ant. Mm -hmm. And uh, I uh, have had a little correspondence here with Professor Suits. First I asked him whether the grasshoppers could be considered Dionysians and the ants Apollonians. And he said, absolutely not, because games uh, the, the, uh, always must be based on very strict rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only type of recreational activity that could be considered Dionysian would be um, drunken brawls or drug tripping and things like that. Now, when contemplating our utopian existence, um, and especially since you also have rather strong religious convictions. Um, can you in any way uh, verbalize your own image of utopia, especially when, as Professor Sood says, the instrumentally valued activities are no longer necessary and only intrinsically valued activities are carried on. And you can see then what my next question will be about how this relates to geography, instrumentally versus intrinsically valued activities. Mm -hmm. But um, have, you, have you thought about utopia at all as to how we will spend our time in utopia? Yes, uh, a little bit, not systematically, but I've looked at different utopian plans in terms mm -hmm. of their geographic implications. We had a dissertation on the anarchist experience in mm -hmm. Spain, for example. Uh, I, 
um, what the geography of the utopia would look like? Or, or just no, of? not necessarily the yeah. geography, just what will we be doing? And, and uh, I suppose we'll, our, our planning of that utopia will have to depend to some extent on what we'll be doing, what games we will be playing that will have intrinsic values. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to do that without looking at the market and the, the force which economics has come to play in the recent centuries in giving people a sense of worth in terms of their take-home pay um, and the structuration of society that's associated with that. So in my utopia, we would have already melted those two imperatives, okay? Um, which takes a bit of imagination to do, but I, I base it on my own experience, okay? 17 years is none. And I never earned anything and didn't ever, uh, you know, have status beyond just one of the community. And those are the high years of my life, no doubt about it. The times when I could be, could study, could work, could interact, could play, uh, without any concern about the status or the market value of what I was doing. So to me, that, that is a, an element of the utopia in which I would like to live. I would also like um, a situation where specialist elitism uh, were either less and less necessary or that it could be educated to be more responsible. Responsible for the basic human need to take a creative say in designing one's own environment, in taking a responsible part in running whatever institutions or workplaces one is involved in. And I don't mean this in a totally anarchist frame. Uh, I think that, that human personhood evolves out of taking responsibility as well as being true to oneself. And so too, communities become societies to the extent that it's possible for them to embrace a larger horizon of responsibility than their own special interests. So I have a geographic picture of utopia. Um, it has, I think, the, the, the geography of it would have to follow from these basic um, assumptions about what is, what is the human person about, and so on. Uh, that means that there's a lot that needs revision about the present way we run things. And I think there's an enormous amount to be learned from, from the East just now. And I anticipate, in, before I die, that uh, Euro-America will be part of history. People will do, be doing an archaeology on some of the games we've been playing because the center of life will be somewhere else. And I'm not sure I'm ready for that, but I'd, uh, I'd like to be ready for that. I'd also like to encourage it. You feel we pay a little too much attention on, in, in geography on the on, uh, instrumentally yes. valued activities and not enough on intrinsically valued activities? Well, I think there are two big sources of that in our recent history. One is positivism, the other is Marxism. Uh, in, in, in making an instrumental theory of value, uh, positivism, in, in, in positivism's emphasis on method, it, it makes instruments uh, the crucial screeners of truth, in a way, and truthful statements. Uh, now, what Marx did with the Hegelian dialectic was in a way to, to uh, instrumentalize this uh, liberation process that was to come from the dialectic. Okay? Uh, I don't know whether one should ascribe that to Marx or to Marxists, but an instrumental theory of value became, uh, became central focus rather than the emancipatory one that was there in Hegel's time. Uh, I think in geography, big G geography, yes, we, in, we have now incorporated much of that, and it's come from other sources as well, but small g geography could never be solely instrumentalist. It was making a home with the earth and, and the wisdom that generations had built up on that. Uh, so I want to see the post-discipline period <laughs> regaining some of the things we had before we became mistresses of the nation-state. With these eloquent <laughs> words, Anne, I think we'll bring our dialogue to a close. Uh, thank you very much for sharing these two hours with, with us. Um, it's been illuminating to them and myself to, to hear your views. It's been a delightful afternoon. And I hope we'll have the pleasure of a visit from you again soon. Thank you for letting us 
tape this unique experience so that in, in, the, in the future it may be shared by some students in our classes who will have then not quite the same experience, but a very similar experience that we did, experiencing your knowledge and your eloquence oh, well. and your erudition. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Thank you. Dr. Ann Buttermillan. Thank you. Thank you.